You're watching QTV and I am Mamadou Mboj. This is a special program organized by the International Center for Transitional Justice. I'm over the months they've organized a few programs on TV and on radio to sensitize people and engage people and discuss um, issues revolving around transitional just justice. Today um, in the studio I've got three people here and we have a topic to discuss, to chew over. And the topic today is opportunities and challenges for the final report recommendations implementation, victims and citizens expectations. I've got um, on my left, um, Maimuna Mane. She is the national gender consultant of the International Center for Transitional Justice. And on her left, I've got um, Mr. Cheryl Gay, who is the national coordinator of Our Nation, Our Voice. And on my right is Mr. Yusuf Taylor. He is a civil society advocate for Team Gumsabopa. Welcome to the, to the, to the program. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. Um, Maimuna, since you are the one from the IC, um, um, TJ, <laughs> maybe we should start with, with, with you. Yeah. It's just a brief summary of what you've been doing. You've done two programs so far, and this is the third. Yeah, so thank you very much, Mr. Mboch. Um, basically, ICTJ, as you said, is the International Center for Transitional Justice. Um, we've been in the Gambia um, since the transitional justice um, process began. Um, we affected our programs in 2018. We've been working um, hand in glove with the TRRC since inception. Um, we've also helped um, civil society organizations. Um, we also work with them. But our main focus also is on transitional justice and uh, women and youth. So this is basically um, what we've been doing. We've been um, engaging um, the, with the TRRC on issues of transitional justice uh, when it comes to the reparation, especially uh, when it comes to access to um, justice for the victims as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure we'll go back to most of what you've just said, mm -hmm. but let's get everybody to, 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 to speak um, 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 first. I mean, I mean, I mean Mr. Mr. Gay, our nation, our voice, how does it come into it? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, our nation of voice actually started was an idea that came from a couple of people. ICTJ played a very significant role uh, when we started it. This was back in 2018, late 2018, when the TRRC, the entire transitional justice process started. So what we decided to do was we decided to bring together um, a very diverse group of young people, that is people in, involved in the art, people into music, poetry, drama, and all that, and then form this group that will echo the voices of the people you know, of this country. That's why it's called Our Nation, Our Voice. So literally, we speak for the people. Not because they don't have a voice, but because not all of us can get on the platform and speak, right? Um, so that is how it was created on the ICTJ. And so um, we later decided to register it as a CS, I mean CSO, and, and then do some activities. So what we've been doing since 2018 to that is um, we've been trying to make sure that the voices of young people and women especially are represented fully in the transitional justice process. And uh, most of the activities we did actually have been with ICTJ, with the TRRC, and a host of other organizations that are involved in the transitional justice process because it cuts across borders right uh, so basically this is what we have been doing and uh, it has been uh, incredible thank you we will come back to you and mr taylor yourself taylor um team gumsa <coughs> what is it about team gumsa Bopa is a um, civil society organization it's a youth-led movement organization in the country our president is killer ace and um, he's got a very popular song about the victims. I'm a victim, which sort of um, really gets people to consider how being a victim feels like. And he actually speaks from the perspective of a person who has been victimized. And um, so many different stories which he has infused into that track. But that is an is a example of what Tim Gomsabapa has done, our president has done. And um, we have been involved in a lot of the whole reform agenda. So from the constitution part, we were working with the um, CRC, where we did a get involved campaign to try to get more young people involved in the constitutional process. Thank you very much, Mr. Taylor. Now let's sink our teeth into the topic. Um, opportunities and challenges for the final implementation, isn't it? Everybody's talking about it. We're all worried about it. Perhaps I should begin here. 
do you think that, for instance, during the campaign, um, um, the candidates uh -huh. were engaging with this thing? What did you feel? What impression did you get, as it were, during the campaign, you know, regarding these recommendations? So um, we've all seen, we've all witnessed the, the campaign period. Um, every candidate had the opportunity to talk to um, the, everyone in the Gambia across um, all regions. Um, but personally, I didn't feel that um, they really delve into the topic like they should. Um, most of the candidates were mostly engaged in um, the infrastructural developments that they they um, they can offer for the people, um, or what or what they have done previously, but then no one really um, exclusively talked about the, the 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 recommendation of the TRC. We can see um, a particular candidate um, who was the former um, TRC lead council actually was maybe he was the one who was really um, talking about it in, in depth but not even as he um, as expected you know but this is something that is very very important it is very very crucial because Gambia we know um, was in a transition and is still in a transition and um, this is a transitional justice um, period I mean it's, it's it's a process that you have to include it in your policies you have to include it in whatever you have to do we have victims in the country you know they are they are listening to you you know they have expectations from you so if they do not feel that they are included in that process I think their their hopes are um, they, they, they would they wouldn't be hopeful for for um, whatever um, the recommendations might might bring forth so I believe that most of the candidates did not do justice to this to these recommendations as in talking about it or what they would have done if um, they they were elected as presidents all right that's interesting I, mean, uh -huh. I wonder mr. Gay, General Gay, did you have a similar view did you take a similar view during, during, during the, the, um, this campaign um, yeah I, I would agree with Maimuna on that but I would like to speak uh, on why exactly the candidates did not talk about it um, the question you ask is why would they avoid it because it was a very raging topic uh, I work with the CSOs um, Tango we had this group of people uh, CSOs what we did was um, we went to them to the candidates and then told them that this is the CSO manifesto, right? This is the manifesto. These are the things we want you people to do for the victims. You have to agree that if you become president, you will do this, you will do this, you will do this. But then they went, F, all of them went across the country, but none of them said anything. So the question we ask is the topic, mm -hmm. transitional justice, what kind of political value did it have for them at the time? It wasn't political capital. It had no form of capital, no value, nothing for them. Do you know why? Because talking about transitional justice means you have to pick one side over another. You either choose the victims out against the perpetrators, and you want everybody to vote for you. Mm -hmm. So it was like going out to the club and having this one drunk guy who's misbehaving that nobody wants to associate with. Do you understand? So they avoided the topic because it had no political capital for them. Mm -hmm. Talking about it means if they supported the victims, then they might lose votes from the perpetrators. If they talk about the perpetrators, then they might lose votes from the victims. So they, they decided the best thing to do is to just avoid it. Mm -hmm. So they talk about the things that people wanted to hear that will make people vote for them. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? So no matter how much we pushed it, mm -hmm. they refused deliberately to talk about it. So the question we ask now, since the election is over and we have a winner declared, maybe it will be easier for them to engage in conversations around transitional justice because there's nothing to lose back then. There's nothing to lose now. The election is done and over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, but they did not talk about it at all. I didn't hear anything about um, transitional justice, not in the campaign. Uh, as far as you're concerned. So here I'll come back to you, Mr. Taylor, not just simply as being a member of um, Team Gumsabo, but as a, as a journalist, just before the elections, we heard a lot of people sort of express some sort of anxiety about whether <laughs> the president or whoever would implement the, the, the full um, um, recommendations of the TRRC. Mm -hmm. But this was just even before the report was submitted. Yes. Why, why do you think people are just so jittery mm. almost about this? Yeah. I think you're you are right on the money. It's before the report has been even made public or was even submitted to the president. And um, people are jittery for sure. Because this is so important. Um, one of the reasons I believe is if you look at the different um, transitional um, processes which have happened, like the Jane Commission, um, the CRC, and many other similar transitional justice. We all know security sector reforms is slow, uh, which relates to 
TRRC and the transitional justice. So that doesn't inspire belief in a lot of people that the government will be doing the same kind of thing. Mm. So a lot of people are worried that the government will actually continue doing the same kind of thing. And with regards to the recommendations, we saw the constitution was thrown out of the National Assembly and um, the rest of them, the Janet Commission has not been fully implemented. So people are concerned for good reason. But um, as a journalist, um, I know you've said, um, my colleagues, the rest have said, but one of the things which I have done for as a journalist is to ask these candidates. I actually had the chance to ask them specifically about the TRRC. We have a publication where it's titled, if you go on Gainako, three presidential candidates speak on TRRC implementation. Now, this publication was actually supported by ICTJ. Huh? So if you go in there, we have asked Honorable Halifa Salah, he is one of the three candidates who spoke about it. In a nutshell, he believes that um, the principles of the TRRC, the fundamental objective is healing, and healing is personal, psychological. It is the individual. This is what Honorable Halifa is saying. Um, we also have, um, of course, the president. And we know, we chronicle, obviously, his push and pull, you could say, love affair, which almost started and ended up very, <laughs> we don't know how where it is right now with APRC. Yaya Jame has um, rejected that alliance. So we talk about that. But President Barrow was very tactical. He did not um, say whether he would implement or so. But he did say, very soon, he will, I will report, receive the report. But as far as I'm concerned, I haven't received the report yet. And if we receive the report, my government will sit over it. He will decide as a government. That's what he is saying. And then we obviously, we also have Usainu Dabo in this article. These are the three leaders which we have chronicled. And he was much more bullish. And um, he was much more upfront. He said that, actually, I cannot be bothered to lose votes. Absolutely. Yeah. But here now, since the election is gone, yeah. maybe the one important person, what the president is, the president. president. Yes, <laughs> exactly. What the president is. Thank you very but, much. But, 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 but this is interesting here because it's also said that um, he will follow the law. <coughs> yes. But, but, but here, since <coughs> our topic here is the opportunities. Mm -hmm. Now, what, what, what opportunities do you reckon that the president's got in implementing these TRRC recommendations? Okay, so um, since the first five years of the transitional justice, I wouldn't say uh, was really uh, as we planned it, but now we have the opportunity to redo, you know, and do it correctly. This TRC would give us the opportunity to do things um, correctly and uh, would to do things right and also to implement the things that, that um, or some of the promises that were given and were not fulfilled. So I guess, um, or I believe the TRRC would now, um, these recommendations would now give us the opportunity to redo things and do them correctly. Also, it will give us the opportunity to look at um, all the sectors, you know. I believe the recommendation would, in, um, would include, or the report would include um, the security sector reform, as he said. And we've seen that the, the um, atrocities that were committed, most of them were committed by the security forces. You know, so this would give us the, the, the opportunity or the, the president the opportunity to look at the security sector reform and to look at it holistically and to see that, you know, the sector is, is f fully reformed, you know, uh, because some of these things, some of these um, military um, PIU or whatever mini, um, security forces um, who committed um, uh, um, atrocities against um, the victims, you would see that they would um, they would have um, a way to see maybe how to punish them, or well, of course, w um, according to the law, of course, but also to reform the whole sector. This is one of the uh, one of my concerns. Like, if the president is going to take this opportunity, you know, it's going to be something that he's given, and then he has the, you know. The, you know the right to say i want to um, implement it or not but then i think that is an opportunity for him to look at the security sector reform you know holistically and and then do things right this time absolutely yes. that's kind of part of the general program of exactly. what they call build back better exactly it's part of part exactly. of that <coughs> um, um but 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 mr gay we have we have to be um, 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 real, realistic here mm -hmm. um recommendations are not binding mm -hmm. 
in the end, the political element. We cannot you know, remove it, we cannot decouple, as it were, politics from these sort of right. recommendations, as we've seen, be it in South Africa, be it in Sierra Leone, all these countries where they've had mm -hmm. the, 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 these things, yes? Mm -hmm. So perhaps we might brace ourselves mm -hmm. for the fact that perhaps some people who've done, who, who did some terrible things might be forgiven, though I was a bit heartened by the fact that the TRRC said that they've not given anybody amnesty. What, what did you make of that? <laughs> so so they've not recommended amnesty, amnesty for anybody. That was very interesting. <laughs> yeah, that was that and and, and the, the fact that the political element, this being a truth commission, maybe some might be given. How do you process that kind of reality? So, so there are two factors that we must consider when it comes to the implementation of the TRRC recommendations. The two, two fundamental factors. Yes. One, that is, um, uh, that will be the political will that we need to make this happen. And two is the economic factor, finance, money. Uh, so, so these are the two factors. When we have the political will and the money is there, it will be easy to implement those things. Um, so right now the question we ask is, is the president in a position where it is difficult for him to give the political will to back the implementation of the recommendations? So, so then you, you divide that into two. You know, they didn't talk about it. He, he, he talked about what the president said. It was very tactical. When we have the report, we will decide then. Because he didn't want to say anything that will put him on the bad side of anything. But wasn't but that a reasonable thing to say? It I was, haven't got it yet. It was a, reason, it was a reasonable thing to say. But he, the reason his, the TRC was set up by his government in the first place was the correct thing. So the least he could have done would have been to take a position. He did not. Even before receiving the, he the could have He could have just made a declaration to support something. Do you understand? He could have said, we will, uh, the TRRC, I worked with the TRRC, by the way, for the f all three, two and a half years, right? I was the deputy coordinator of the Youth and Children's Unit. I, I, I did a lot of with, with them. The least he could have done, because we said the TRRC was victim-centered, right? Mm -hmm. Victim-centered. He could have at least said, no matter what happened, we will get behind the victims. He didn't have to say we will prosecute people, but we can support, we can, he can support operation, he can support something. Just make a declaration that shows us that there is, the, you have the intention to give the political will that is required to implement. He did not do that. He was tactical because there was a campaign coming. Right now, the question we ask, what does the president have to lose when he implements the recommendation? Mm -hmm. Absolutely nothing. So that is an opportunity. This is a chance he has to reunite this country, to heal the country, to show them that, look, I did not just make this proclamation back then. I am committed to making them happen. He has five years to do that. Second, not just the TRRC. When it comes to the, the, the CRC, the Constitution right now, the president has an opportunity to do something incredible. He can bring back the Constitution. Because one of the reasons why the Constitution was rejected, they will not tell you this, was because of the issue of the time limit. If the Constitution was, was, uh, was had passed back then, Barrow's time was going to count. Do you understand? But now that is over. He can bring back the constitution because in law, we say the law cannot be retroactive. It cannot go back. So his time cannot be affected. So not just the TRRC. He has the, he has the opportunity to correct a lot of things and he will not lose political capital over it. Mm -hmm. Right now, if he implements the recommendations, he will not lose political capital over it. But the people, he will reinstate the people's trust in him. Mm -hmm. Because his victory is massive. Nobody has ever won this way. But there are a lot of factors that people are not considering. Do you understand? I'll come back to yeah. you. Um, 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 Yusuf, this is very interesting here because one would be inclined to, to, to ask, what has the president done? Why are we all skeptical kind of, about whether he would implement the TRRC recommendations? Mm -hmm. Why? What triggered, if you can, one can put it that, what triggered this sort of um, skepticism? Yeah. What, what do you think? Yeah, um, I think if you really want to get to the bottom of that, you need to look at security sector reforms. The two of them and TRRC are inextricably linked. Mm -hmm. And I'll use an example. I, didn't, I, don't, I don't need to call names, mm -hmm. but we have um, security officers in highest position of security mm -hmm. who have confessed in some instances to human rights violations. Um, I will just to give a little bit of example here, I think, for example, the case of Gorgin Bu is a clear example who he clearly declared that he violated the rights of young people and but he is still he was still heading the um, anti-crime for quite a while mm -hmm. and nobody knows whether he has been returned in there or not. So we have seen that the National Human Rights Commission has made a, a very important statement to say that they should not play politics with this TRRC, mm -hmm. that they should put the politics aside. Now, you will never have the never again achieved mm -hmm. if we are going back 
to those same individuals who have been responsible, who have been seen as perpetrators, and they have been left to head institutions, security institutions, what officers will they bring, will they lead? So in a nutshell... So how does that connect? to whether the president will implement the TRRC recommendations mm -hmm. or not. Yes. Where, how, where do you make the connection? So the connection is, if the president was wanted to show the seriousness or show that the TRRC is a very, very important process, any security officer who comes and testifies and acknowledges, accepts to be violating the um, rights of any citizen should be given what? They should be given leave. They should be investigated, pending the results of the investigation, especially if the person admits to human rights violations. You see, these highlight that. So, so here, here, the reasoning is that yeah. since he had behaved in a particular way in one incident, mm -hmm. if you give him something similar, he might, exactly. but not necessarily that he mm -hmm. will be exactly. exactly the exactly. given way. But, but let's, let's move on a bit. That, that's quite interesting there. <laughs> What, what are the biggest fears? Because I've seen that y your emphasis sort of tend to be on reparations, very, really, you know, focused and concentrated on mm -hmm. reparations and, and, and sexually um, 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 based gender violence, that, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So what are your biggest fears, I wonder, in this, in this area? So um, we, uh, when it comes to gender issues, we are concentrating, of course, on the, uh, the majority of the victims are, are women you can say even this is because even you violate a man uh, the consequences would would land on the on the women and the children right so our fear here is that you know if these recommendations are not you know Im implemented you know where would would these victims see themselves you know where would these victims see themselves if you uh, are supposed to grant um, I mean not everyone is looking for reparations per se some some want um, access to justice you know they want justice to be done you know maybe you you kill someone's father the person does you cannot give anything to that person to 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 say this is um, a form of reparations for for, for killing the, the, um, the, the father or the son or the mother but perhaps seeing the perpetrator behind bars is, is enough for that, for that individual. So what we are saying is if these families, okay, the victims' families do not have justice, where, where do we see ourselves? Are we going to see, you know, a rise of uh, violence in the country? You know, it's, a, it's possible. We can see a, a possible rise of violence because you're saying that um, a particular person killed my father and he's freely lo roaming on the streets. You know, his kids are freely roaming on the streets, whilst I and my family are still suffering the consequences of, you know, what happened to my father. So these are, these are possible, like we can say a civil unrest is one of the possibilities. If, if um, uh, let's say the recommendations, um, uh, the report recommends that um, perpetrators are per prosecuted and they are not. That is one. Another thing is that um, if the, when we come to the re um, reparations aspect, um, most of the victims did not register with the TRC. And they did this um, maybe after when, when the registration wa uh, was closed. Now they, they, they don't have anywhere to go. Um, they are saying that the Ministry of Justice should set up um, another institution, a, re a reparation committee. But we, we're yet to see that. We are yet to see a reparation committee. So who, who said that? Is it a suggestion? No, so it, it's supposed to be. It's supposed to? Yeah, it's supposed to be. Did the ministry sort of commit itself to it? I wonder. Um, um, the mm. ministry is, is saying that well, when, when it comes to justice, like uh, when it comes to justice and accountability and issues of that regard, um, they are going to be, you know, they are going to be available. But what I'm saying is, is the government really committed? To set up this institution, when um, the TRRC submitted this, this should have been done before the TRRC closes. Now the TRRC has closed. You know, where do the victims go? Some of these people were given 19% of their reparation. You know, which is very, very small. You know, it's very, very small, especially with victims of SGBV. Some of them do not have their husbands with them anymore. You know, these these people were the breadwinners in in their families. Now they have to struggle for themselves from hand to mouth, you know. 
So all these things have, have to be put into consideration. The, in, the reparation comi committee or institution should be in place now. You know? But the TRRC had that reparations unit, wasn't it? And already, as you've already yes. indicated, that some reparations have, have already have begun been given, to be given. But to that be is not enough. That is just 19% yes. of that reparation. Yeah. In fact, those, those who are given the monetary reparation, they were only given 19% of it. And 81% is to be given by the government, and the government is yet to establish that. So, what, and they are not communicating. That's, that's the biggest problem. They are not communicating to the victims. Right now, there is a vacuum. The, the TRC is closed. The victims do not have anywhere to go because they cannot just show up at the Ministry of Justice and ask for reparation. They don't even know where to go. They just have a piece of paper that states what amount you're going to get um, when this committee is set up. But where is the committee? So these are all um, issues. These are all fears that we are having. So yeah. there the appears that there's no structural link no. between perhaps the ministry and victim centers and other no. civil society organizations directly. As far as I'm concerned. As far as, well. as you're concerned. That's yeah. interesting. Mr. Gay, the challenges here, she's just sort of cataloged <laughs> for some of the challenges faced by this, the, the recommendations and what would be implemented and, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Quite, quite interesting times ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> She's right about one thing. Mm -hmm. I, I think um, there's a structural problem, especially mm -hmm. the post TRRC. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think they, uh, they did, the TRRC did talk about the committee, but the committee has not been set up. So I think the plan is not very clear as to exactly what happens. And that leaves the victims dangling around with nothing to do. And the 19% was also a big problem because mm -hmm. TRRC recommended that for reparations, they will need $205 million to do that. The government gave them $50 million. So with that 50 million, that is what they use and give and are given victims 19 percent of their reparations, and then saying when government gives us the remaining 155 million, we will give you we will give you the 81 percent that is left from your reparations, right? But she was talking about some of the challenges of what happens. What are the fears? I think the fears for me is is what what lessons do we draw from this, right? Especially when the when the when the recommendations are not implemented. What are the lessons that we draw? Uh, Timothy Snyder wrote this book called Tyranny, and in it he talked about uh, 20, 20 lessons for the 20th century. And one of the lessons is he said, take responsibility for the for the face of the world. Right. So what this means is if people in power in this country can do the most inhuman acts to their fellow human beings that they are supposed to serve in this country, they can kill them, lock them up, take their property, torture them and still get away with it. Do you think the people who will be in power now will be afraid of doing those same things? They will not be because the precedence has been set that you can kill people, you can lock them up, you can torture them, then a commission can be set up, you can come and sit on TV and confess all of those things to this country and still go scot-free. Mm -hmm. What do you have to fear? So what kind of country are we building? This will defeat the purpose of the Never Again campaign, the non reoccurrence will be defeated, mm -hmm. and what another thing that it will do is, it will confirm to the people in power that when you are in this particular position, when you have this amount of power, you can do whatever you want in this country and nothing will happen. And that is how you build a totalitarian country. That is how you build dictatorship. That is how, uh, that's how tyranny is born. If Barrow is convinced that he can get away with anything, if the IGP, if the simple police officers, uh, uh, security forces, all of them are convinced they can just do whatever they want with people and get away with it, that is how dictatorship happens. They, they, they are not born, they are made, and that's how you make them. And the, la the, the failure to implement the TRC recommendation, this is the message it will send to everyone. Mm -hmm. Uh, just one, uh, one more point. Yeah. Dur during the campaign, I was doing um, um, social media monitoring for uh, uh, Gambia participate, and there was a speech that the president did in Farafenye, where he was bragging about security forces exactly. using tear gas on, on, the tree, uh, on the three years journal movement, and everybody was shouting and clapping. That was scary to me because the people had no idea what they were applauding for. Mm -hmm. A president was taking credit for unproportionate force being used on peaceful protesters, and the very people are applauding that. Do you have any idea what message you're sending? Next time, when the police officers are using force, they can use whatever force they want without even asking for permission. Do you know why? Because the president said something that to them confirmed if that situation should repeat itself, then they can use as much force as they want because the president celebrates it and the people applaud it. Uh, that, that, that's an interesting. Maybe he wasn't exactly boasting, but maybe threatening if he go out, this could possibly happen so to deter them, <laughs> maybe. That's a different topic. Yeah. <laughs> so, go. But, but, Mr. Mr. Taylor, um, do, do you share this sort of uh, kind of foreboding? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> kind of I mean, foreboding about the prospects of mm -hmm. these. Do, do you share the same? 
Yeah, I mean, there are certainly concerns. I am a human rights advocate. Just last week or a week before, I published, I will help uh, a young rapper called Shifai, um, who was brutalized by security, allegedly brutalized by security officers. And it's, been, it's made the news last week. Um, I assisted him as a human rights activist, took him to um, the National Human Rights Commission, advised him on how to proceed with his case. I mean, the never again slogan is in threat, is in jeopardy of being sunk. And um, the reason will be if we don't set examples. There must be examples made. Now, but before we set examples, I believe Gambians are very forgiven. But if we take advantage of that mm -hmm. forgiveness, they can turn on you. Mm -hmm. To really make sure that the Gambians can forgive, support them with the reparations. Mm -hmm. What does reparations mean is another important question. Mm -hmm. When people say reparations, they just think that these people just want money. Mm -hmm. I can tell you they the Hyderas family returned the money. Mm -hmm. They don't want it. Yusuf Ambai. When he came to first initially return his money, I was there with him. He called me to witness him returning his money. And we, based on some of the promises made, which we wrote, published it, he actually returned the money the first day. He didn't return it, sorry, but then came back later and returned the money. But what I'm trying to say, for him, reparations means helping him. He is not very well. He is, needs a lot of help as somebody who is um, now being incapacitated. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody who was playing football active. Reparations means something different. It's not the money mm -hmm. he wanted. He wanted other things so that he could get on with his life. The family of Deda Haidara have enough money. Mm -hmm. How much money are you going to pay for them to, to, to reparate? Um, but they want to see the seriousness, the political will from the government to say that, yes, we are behind the victims. We are going to make sure that they get their reparations, that they can live on, move on with their lives. And then, trust me, when it comes to the justice part, they will be, that would be a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. But if these victims are not supported, and sometimes I like to, I want to raise this. This TRRC is not just about Gambians and Gambian victims. Mm -hmm. They are about some 54 West Africans who were killed and they should also be paid a hundred and plus million, which in my calculation, because I had published that statistics with regards to the amounts of payments for reparations, that actually is not part of that 205 million. Mm -hmm. It's another extra. So how does Gambia look on the international stage? Mm -hmm. How are we treating, what message are we saying about our African brothers and sisters? This is very important to how we Gambia uh, our international relation mm -hmm. also. And I want to believe um, our government will not jeopardize them. <laughs> Let's see. Yes. They already <laughs> promised that they are, going, they are putting 150 million in the 2022 budget. So when we talk about opportunities, let's also register that yes, from the government too. Mm -hmm. Yes. So hopefully that, that they will be the balance from the 200 million the TRC said they needed for reparations. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, so I'm, that's I'm, a good one. I'm, I'm absolutely, this is never again slogan. The problem is perhaps it's just a slogan. Uh, apparently they've been saying it since Nuremberg <laughs> after 19. <laughs> <laughs> what, what if I, um, um, Maimuna, I'm um, here, your organization, the ICTJ, you've been organizing lots of discussions of what is creating platforms where people can discuss and be sensitized and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. What do you hope to achieve? What groundswell, mm -hmm. as it were, mm -hmm. of, of, of um, um, the crusade, as it were, what do you hope to achieve with people, all of these people being trained regarding particularly with these recommendations? What do you hope to achieve? Um, so first of all, um, the first thing is for people to understand what transitional justice really is. You know, um, we've been going to consultations. We've been having dialogues with the women and the youth in collaboration with our national voice. Um, we we want people to understand, like Yusuf was saying, reparation is not just monetary. You understand? Reparation goes beyond that. You know, uh, for, for like I gave the previous examples, reparation can mean justice so, to someone else. You know, it can mean an apol uh, an apology to from from so, from the perpetrator. 
it, it, it has different forms. So for people to understand that um, transi I mean, in the transitional justice process, uh, when we talk about the reparation, it's not only monetary aspect that we are talking about. We are talking about it from all different angles. And also, we want um, the victims especially, um, we, we sort of manage their expectation. You know, yeah, because it is very important. Um, we've seen how victims' expectations, you know, was was you know very high. Um, one one example is the Faraba incident. When the Faraba incident happened, when people were killed, uh, we've we've seen the president or the commission. When a, a, a commission was established, the victims were given a million dollars. Now look at the TRRC's victims. Um, the highest paid is six hundred thousand. Mm. So you can see that when that happened, it triggered the victims or it, it subconsciously they, they, they are thinking we might also get a million. You know, some of them were thinking uh, on that line, but it is very important to manage these expectations. Now, um, the highest um, when, when, when you come to um, those who were murdered, they are given 600,000 or their families are given 600,000. Dialysis. So it is very important to always have these dialogues with the people, especially. So what our cons, um, area of concentration is um, women and youth in the region, you know, those in the in the provinces. We go talk to them, um, make them understand, you know, what this whole process is about. And I think it's 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 paid well because um, um, over the months, especially these last months when the reparation or the report was. Um, so, um, to be submitted, we, we've we've really um, you know have improvements from from the victims. They they are really showing their concern, but they're also you know ready to collaborate with the government. You know when it comes to um, whatever projects that the government would have for them, and then these are things that I believe um, are very important. And then these reports, whatever um, the reports that we write and everything, government should really look into them. You know, we are making it public. Um, Yusuf said that they are, they are having publications that they are doing. You know, so government really needs to look at this and also hear from the people, especially those who were not out on TV to testify. You know, during the TRRC, these are these are some of the opportunities that they can also have to listen to their concerns. You know, what they have and then their fears as well. Um, absolutely, yeah. and perhaps another thing would be, you know, um, this this groundswell of interest, as they mm -hmm. call it, will become a pressure, would it not, on government maybe to, to, to implement this. That's also another angle that everybody must be sensitized, CSOs, ordinary people, mm -hmm. so that that could form its own lobby, its own pressure right. on, on government. Uh, yeah, um, because the, wo the work of our national voice, for example, uh, to be specific, has been exactly on that, uh, because we realize this whole, I'm um, the voice of the voiceless, nobody's voiceless, yeah? yeah. Everybody has a voice. So what we realized was we're not going to fix the problem. We're not going to change. The Never Again campaign is not going to be achieved by having a couple of CSOs sitting on TV or radios talking. No, you, don't, you, you cannot speak for the people. Mm -hmm. What you do is you go to the people, you tell them what they have, you explain to them that Barrow's power, the National Assembly members, the power they have is mm -hmm. borrowed from them through their voters' cards. And every action they take, every statement they make should be on their behalf, in their interest, for their welfare. And you make them understand that this power comes from them and they own it so they must stand up and own up to that you show them who they are what kind of standing and regards they should have as citizens of this country and when they understand that power you teach them how to wield it and then they can get what they want do you understand mm -hmm. because the government is not going to listen to us if it is just a couple of people speaking this what they are going to do is exactly what the colonial masters taught them divide and rule how was the conversation about tribalism d during the election mm -hmm. very hectic mm -hmm. The conversation about uh, who, who comes from here, who comes from there, who's from this tribe, who's from that tribe. It's not that we, we are not tribalists. We lived here for millions of years before the white man came. But they taught us a tactic that we keep using, that is divide and rule. Divide the people and side with the side that is bigger, pain the other one as devils, let everybody else hate them. When you get what you want, move on. Do you understand? So as civil society organizations, as individuals in organizations that are saying we are advocating for the right and welfare of the people, we're speaking and acting for their interests, the best thing we can do is teach the people about their power, about their rights, and let them understand that, and then they can wield it for themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because if not, what will happen is we will be divided among ourselves. And when we are divided, then it will be easier for the government to disregard whatever we push. Because what, what are you talking about? You're advocating for something. You cannot even agree on anything and you want me to do it? But that's it. But don't you see right? that perhaps that makes your project maybe a longer term issue? Mm -hmm. 
the teaching of, of the people, somehow it may sound straightforward enough, mm -hmm. but we all know that in reality, it's a kind of generational game it in takes, many ways, isn't it? It takes time. So what do we do now? What must be our strategy, mm -hmm. be simply as a citizen mm -hmm. or a member of a civil society organization mm -hmm. or, or anything? Yeah. What is it that we can do now, mm -hmm. given the constraints mm -hmm. and also given our long-term objects? Yeah, yeah. Long term objective. Mm. So, so right now, the, the, the mm. actually the, uh, the greater part of the burden falls on civil society organization. Mm. As I said, Flex, I think you are aware of the, the CSO manifesto that we d that we did uh, we did write before the election. Uh, I don't think it ended up being signed. But what happened is we wrote an entire manifesto, right, asking the political the, the, the candidates the, the candidates for the, the presidential candidates to comment that if any of them ends up in office as president, they have agreed that they will implement the TRRC recommendation and finish the remaining transitional justice. Uh, uh, commitment. But you said nobody signed it. No, we, we did not. I don't think okay. the signing was done. I'm not sure. I didn't. I did not witness the signing. But I remember we did, and then uh, the validation was done with Uncle Mari and all of those before, right? So, so the right now, the report is there. The report has has been there. So what we can do as civil society organization is come together. Forget about the line, the line of difference. Come together, get behind the victims, and push. That way we can get this done. Because the teaching is slow. But if you go back to the co provinces right now, into the communities and speak to the people, the conversation has totally changed. Mm -hmm. The first time I went there, when we, when we, when we show up, he sees here, first caravan, everywhere we showed up, when we, when we give them the mic to speak, the first thing you hear them say is, we want to tell you that we are 100% behind the president, we, we will be the pres behind the president today and tomorrow, and then we have to be like, no, 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 we're not here for the president, we're here <laughs> for you, right? And the conversation has changed. Now, if you go back to those communities now, the conversation is completely different completely different right because i remember there was this community we, we went to farafenye and this woman they were talking about uh, how they, they they had boreholes now there was a road blah 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 i was like you know you should not thank the president for that it is his job everybody who gets there is their job to do that i was like what i was like you should not sing and clap for them and they, these women had to confess that they never knew that. I said, that money comes from you. I said, even if you sell bread and nyebe, kuija imbura ak nyebe, right? You pay, then, then I find namo. Halis bobo langur bidi and they, they build things for you. They're not doing anything for you. It's your money from your pocket, mm -hmm. right? So you have a conversation like that. You explain it to them. I had to take a pen specifically, my when I was there, and tell them exactly how the government make tax from you buying a pen. I said, you pay for everything. Me, this is going to take a minute. Let me just... <laughs> <laughs> right? So... so I, 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 your right. point, no? right. we, we, we get your so, point. So, so but when, very, you, very when you do that, mm -hmm. when you do that, and yeah. they know. Mm -hmm. Now, when a person shows up there for campaign, for example, the, and you invite a woman like that to speak, the things he's going to say is going to be different from what he would have said without before that training, mm -hmm. before that engagement. Mm -hmm. The things he's going to ask for are going to be different. The questions he's going to pose to a political candidate or, or a president or a minister, whoever it is, is going to be totally different because there is awareness. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to increase on that. We need to do more and more and more of those activities. But mm -hmm. currently, as for the TRC recommendation, what I really am pleading for is all of the CSOs in this country, civil society organization, have to come under one umbrella, mm -hmm. get behind the victims. We have a victim center. They are well organized and, and they have every victim in this country registered with them. From there, we can push ahead and then we can put pressure on the government to make sure the recommendations are implemented. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, Mr. Taylor, yourself, um, um, you, you want to say something? Yes. Mm -hmm. So what he's saying is, is true. Um, I just want to emphasize that there is a huge gap, you know, between the urban areas and the rural area. And then I think most of the things that we are doing, we, we put our concentration more on the urban areas, but we have to look back, you know, especially the women in the rural, rural communities. You know, these women enjoy everything, you know, they, they, they are suffering, you know. We, we have to put that into consideration, you know, aside their victimization, you know, they, 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 they lack an amenities, they lack, you know, soci basic social, you know, facilities that they need. You know, when we talk about hospitals, good markets, good road infrastructure, you know, so the gap is really huge. You know, and this, this, these are things that we should put into consideration. Yes, that's, yes. That, that's absolutely yeah. true. And even though perhaps one might point out that, I mean, all those women, they appear to have voted for Barrow when you look at the margins wow. all over the place. So the media, mm -hmm. you know, because of that, that connection is very important in mm -hmm. all of this, isn't, mm -hmm. it, isn't it? The awareness yeah. programs and mm -hmm. the trying to make people understand that explanation, that engagement, that engage mm -hmm. with, with the people. So how would the, the media, how should we treat this?
Yeah. So it's a rather complex situation we're in, right? It is. Don't you think? It is. Um, mm. With the media, this is very important because of we will even shape how the people look at it and how the people think about it. Uh -huh. uh, what we're doing that as right now <laughs> on the radio, on the TV. Mm -hmm. So um, certainly we need to get hold of the right information. Uh -huh. That means the report, to be specific, it needs to come to us. Um, we know they have given copies to the um, ministry mm -hmm. and the president and they are also providing to a few um, international organizations, international yeah. organizations but Gambia should have this mm -hmm. it should have been like the CRC public knowledge you know where the soon as it's out everybody can access it online and at least people will buy into it so that I believe is the first step for the media needs to get their hands in it to disseminate that trickle it down to the masses I remember on the CRC I had a program where we were um, using local languages, literally going through sections of the CR constitution, mm -hmm. CRC, so that people will be able to understand it. So I think that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. um, and there are other things which need to be done. So for even civil society, as also I'm a civil society advocate, we need to come together and have a monitoring group, mm -hmm. a group which monitors all the recommendations. We should have done that for the, the Jane Commission. We should have been at the end of the year, even producing a report. This, this is what they have implemented on the Jani Commission. Jani Commission spent a lot of money. And in fact, if it was done correctly, Gambians would have had a lot more money back. Mm -hmm. Tractors which were littered all over the place could have been reused and given to farmers. Many of the assets which are sitting down currently dilapidating could have been sold. So they are losing value as they are going. So these are the kind of these are the reasons why people are concerned about the TRRC. Okay. Besides that, the government. So I've spoken about the media. I've spoken about civil society. Must monitor. We need to hold the government to account uh -huh. by doing that. Saying that look, you've you've only implemented twenty percent, ten percent so far. Twenty percent, good. Keep it going. Fifty until we get to one hundred percent. The government. Currently, the victims are in a gap. Uh -huh. There is no TRRC. Uh -huh. Then the reparations is supposed to allegedly has been started. Where is it? Which body, which in this institution is going to currently right now see the victims? Okay. If a victim wants to come before they would be going to the, should they continue going to the TRRC right now to discuss their reparations? The government must with, un, uh, urgently, immediately fill up that gap she was talking about. Uh -huh. That gap needs to be urgently filled. The victims are currently left in limbo. Uh -huh. Once they have that, the reparations is going, obviously. Justice uh, will probably be, for me, the last section. Once we have justice and then the security sector reforms is in line, at the end of the day, if we have a security institution where perpetrators are still heading these institutions, never again is, is finished. Mm -hmm. It's sunk. They will continue to have people violated. They will see that, look, wait, I can actually, officers that are down, lower in the rank, they can see that, well, I can still be the head of an institution even after perpetrating and violating the human rights of Gambians. That must stop. Mm -hmm. And the government is, needs to act on this seriously. In fact, for me, Right now, they should suspend every single security officer who has confirmed, openly committed and said that, yes, they were involved in violating. They should suspend them pending investigation. Mm -hmm. So until these are done, media, CSO, government, and of course the people. Yes. Um, my winner, mm -hmm. we were just talking there about what, 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 what should be expected of mm -hmm. CSOs and the like. So I'm just wondering, what about ICTJ? I mean, you've been sensitizing, you've been doing all of these things, mm -hmm. then what, what, what next? What, what, yeah, what, so, what's um, we, yeah, so thank you. So we've <laughs> um, recently, we, we conducted a study. This was um, during the um, last part of the TRRC. Um, some of the victims of um, who publicly went um, on TV to testify or were part of the um, participants. So we had um, victims of um, sexual and gender-based violence. Um, this uh, research was um, a research on the opportunities 
you know, for survivors of um, conflict-related um, sexual and gender-based violence. So you would see in this um, study that we, 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 we um, had 77 participants, of, of whom um, 65 were women. And it's, it's the same narr narrative. It's just like um, one would have it um, a little bit uh, more than the others like when it comes to um, the violations or the types of violations but all all of them had issues all of them were violated you know some were di directly um, violated some were indirectly violated but when you look at ICTJ's work on this report you would see that the women came out more you know they had this opportunity to express themselves you know they had this opportunity to talk about the things um, that they are expecting Perhaps they would not have that during the TRC or some of them, we know how hard it is to come on, on TV and sit and narrate your, you know, your experiences. But, you know, when we have a one-on-one one -on -one discussion or when we have a focus group discussion, when, when I know that I'm, I'm within my peers and all of these people, you know, have suffered one way or the other, you know, they are more comfortable in talking. And this is what the study revealed. You know, we had the study and then they said the things that, you know, really mattered to them. They also gave the opportunities, you know, they also like um, have the opportunity to say what they needed from the government, you know, as victims. And I thought, I, and I think that is very, very, very important. They are given the opportunity to talk about what they need from this, um, um, from the government, the current government. They talk about their children's education. They talked about their livelihoods. They talked about their financial situation. And I believe um, this report would be shared, of course, with, with the, um, it was um, handed to the National Human Rights Com Com um, Commission. It was also given to the Ministry of Justice. So I believe, the, and then the Ministry of Justice, of course, um, they are committed. I believe they are committed to look at the report and also work on it. Um, and it's the same thing for the NHRC. They are also the National Human Rights Commission. So they are going to look at the report and they are, you know, they are going to implement some of these things that are recommended by the women and the men in this study. Absolutely. Right. The, the studies and inquiries, they mm -hmm. are like mirror images of mm -hmm. what goes on because right. we, we know for, we know, for instance, that in um, sexual gender-based violence, there's a lot happening when you look at the statistics, even yeah. outside the TRRC, yes. the wider general issues. But, but this is it, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, in the end, our campaigns and, um, um, and our crusade, whatever, would really have to engage with a wider cultural element, mm -hmm. which in the end will form the institutions. Mm -hmm. We are our institutions, right. after all, yeah. isn't it? Right. <laughs> so this is the key, isn't yeah. it? The, Ultimately, the, the, yeah. The, the, the cultural issue you're talking about mm -hmm. is, uh, is, 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 is fundamental. You know, it's mm -hmm. funny. Mm -hmm. um, I was asking questions about this, right? I, I went to um, a network against gender-based violence. Uh, so they have these one-stop centers mm -hmm. in all major uh, hospitals Health. and also Health. in the regions. Mm -hmm. So they have a police officer, a lawyer, for example, and a doctor. So if you're raped, for example, you know, a police officer takes your statement, a doctor checks you, and then a lawyer makes sure the case is filed and everything. Can you believe that, uh, from what I know, that there is not one single case of, of sexual and gender-based violence that has been convicted in this country? Because you start a case, right? You start a case. And this has nothing to do with the TRC, by the way. <laughs> you start a case, you go up to a certain level, and then the family of the victim will come and, you know, like... So, so <laughs> we, we, we just, just no, no, I'm not coming. I'm, I, I just want to. I just want to come to the issue of um, um, institutional reform because that is part of the transitional justice process, mm -hmm. right? Not just the social security sector, but institutional reform. Mm -hmm. A lot of institutions were compromised. The reason Jamie was able to pass certain laws is because the National Assembly wasn't strong. The reason why some people were convicted on bogus charges was because the judiciary was messed up. The reason why people just got arrested and tortured was because of the police. So it's a lot of institutions, not absolutely. just security. Sector. Oh, oh, absolutely. And we have to build. We, 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 we've come to the end. Yeah. <laughs> the program. Um, thank you very much, um, Mr. Yusuf Taylor. Thanks mm -hmm. for being here, and my Munamane and Cherno Gay. Until the next time, I'm Mudumbuch. Goodbye.